I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Wes Topol. I'm uh, uh, co-facilitating co this class with Stephen, who you met last week and uh, did a good job of uh, starting our, our class on discipleship. And so um, we're going to jump in in a minute, but I think before we do, we'll, we'll go to our Father in prayer. Does anybody have any special prayer requests? I know we need to keep uh, Blanca's niece, Tiffany, in our prayers. The young lady that was in a car accident uh, just came out of surgery, I think, yesterday. Uh, broken neck, I believe. Um, so very serious uh, recovery in front of her. If we generate more. So any anything other than Tiffany right now? It's a prayer request. Well, well, we'll open with a prayer. If you would, uh, please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for the time that we have to spend together, uh, to come to this place to uh, worship you. But this hour to come together and to open your word and to, uh, to learn uh, more of your, your will for us, Father, and to, to especially look at your, your great commission, the commission that you have for each and every one of us to, to go and to make disciples of, of others to to spread your word and father as we uh, uh, do that this morning as we as we discuss uh, uh, some things father we just ask that our hearts be open and that our our, our uh, um, we would be uh, uh, mindful of the things that you would want us to pursue and um Father, as we think about those that aren't with us this morning, we're, we're very mindful of Tiffany, uh, Blanca's niece, who was in a very serious car accident earlier this week, and we just pray that um, everything went well with the surgery, uh, that uh, we know that she's going to have a long uh, road ahead of her, but we just pray that you will be with the doctors and you'll be with the rehab and the recovery, and that uh, things, will, things will have a good outlook for her, Father. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for um, the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. So um, as introduced last week, we're going to be doing a uh, 12, 13 week series um, on um, using this, this book, uh, Real Life Discipleship. Okay. And so... Um, we're going to explore some of the, the ideas in the book. But as Steve said last week, we're not bound to just following that curriculum. Uh, we may be going off in a different direction based on um, your, your thoughts and input. I also say this, as I've done a lot of uh, in the schools, professional development, this is not a sit and get. You ever heard that term? This is not a sit and get. Um, if you think Steve or I are experts on this subject and your job is just to sit back and absorb this knowledge, uh, I'm, I, I want to tell you up front that's not going to be the case. You would be disappointed. Um, you know, we, we are going to view ourselves as facilitators. We want to be able to help uh, facilitate. So there's going to be some opportunity as we uh, do our, our uh, class to have some, there's some going to be some things that individually we want you to do some self-reflection on and maybe not share so much, but think about that uh, to yourself. There's going to be some large group discussions, but then um, we're going to try at least every week, at least when I teach, to break you out into some small groups. Okay, so to give you the, the opportunity to um, maybe, maybe be paired with some folks that you don't normally uh, talk with or, or uh, share information with. So um, that's kind of the way we're, we're kind of seeing this, uh, this uh, work out for this, this course. Um, the, uh, some of the things that we talked about last week, we really got into Matthew 28. We, we looked at that Great Commission, and we looked at that is basically our mission. That's our, our marching orders uh, from, from uh, Jesus himself. And so, uh, Stephen, 
share with you those, those four uh, action uh, words that are in that. Uh, if you remember, go make disciples, baptize them, teaching them. And so one of the things that we want to make sure that we're clear on is making disciples is a, is a process. It's, it, it involves not just baptizing and moving on, but baptizing, but then also teaching them. And so one of the things that's in this curriculum that we'll, we'll spend some time looking at is the idea that just like we grow as humans and we're born, we're infants, we're young children, uh, then we move into adolescence and adulthood, the same goes for our spiritual, spiritual lives. We are born, we're baptized, we're born again, uh, and then we, we move into this phase in our Christianity where we're, we're infants, you know, the the writer talks about ba a babe in Christ, somebody that's, that's not ready for the meat of the word, but, but needs that special instruction. And so we'll talk about these different phases as we move into uh, that uh, childhood phase and then into this young adulthood phase and ultimately into uh, the, uh, the adulthood when we think about Christianity. And again, we're, we're talking about our Christian growth, not necessarily physical. So you could have somebody that is a younger person, but spiritually they could be further along in their, in their spiritual growth. Um, so the, the four words that we, you're going to see through this series are share, connect, minister, and disciple, because it was felt like the focus of the work that you do to make those disciples uh, in those different phases of, of that spiritual life uh, are different when we're talking about that, the, the, the lost, those that don't know Christ, uh, and those, those young, young Christians, we're primarily sharing, uh, as, as we move on, we're connecting as we get into that young, uh, adulthood. Now we're starting to equip them to minister. So if you think about this church and we think about, uh, a couple weeks ago, Easter, Easter weekend, what was a activity that a lot of our young people went to um, where, they, where they, they exhibited their talents of, of, of ministry? L LTC. So that's an that's a excellent example of where they're, they're equipping those, those folks for ministry, providing ministry opportunities. Uh, and eventually releasing those 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 young people to ministry. So uh, again, this is kind of where we're going. So over the course of of our time, we're going to spend some time diving a little deeper into each of those for sharing, connecting, ministering, and discipleship, uh, discipling. Okay, um, I I put this in there because one of the key pieces of this. Uh, Curriculum is the idea of reproducible disciple making, and uh, this is this is pending copyright. I haven't I haven't filed yet, but uh, if you think about if you think about a pyramid scheme, we we don't have favorable uh, feelings about pyramid schemes, right? That's normally not a good thing, but we think about God's scheme for disciple making it's a perfect it's a perfect pyramid scheme because it's it's God's scheme it's his plan for for us spreading the gospel and growing the church and, and the way it works and the way we're going to explore this uh, over the course of this quarter is it begins with you and I right and it begins with those that we are connected with and we share the good news to them and hopefully they share the good news, and the next thing you know, that's the process. Um, it sounds simple, right? Sounds simple. It's, a, it's the most simple process there, there is, you would think. But it's, it's not. Um, if we think about this scripture, and I know Stephen covered this last week, we, we're told uh, that... that uh, we're going to be victorious. The uh, evil is not going to overtake this. Uh, this is this is uh, 
um, this is going to work out. We're not going to be defeated in this mission that we have to, to, to make disciples. But we also talked about last week that it may not feel like we're winning, right? Stephen talked about, uh, you know, winning, winning. And um, does it feel like every, every day, are, are we losing ground? Are we making ground? Um, I found this article, and I, I don't want to go to the negative so fast, but it, it's a wake-up call for us, right? Has anybody read this article or seen it? There's a, a QR code. If you know how to use that on your phone, if you want, if you want, you can snap it, and it'll download the the PDF version of the article. But there's some there's some uh, pretty um, pretty bleak facts there. Um, basically, when we think about the churches of Christ, yes, yeah, Steve. Well, I, I just in addition to this, I do know that at one time. The Church of Christ was the fastest growing religious group in the world. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember when that was. Early 1950s, I think, with about the 50s and 60s. Well, I, I it was the change, but we, we've almost done a 180. Yeah. I wouldn't say we're declining that fast, but we are in decline. Yeah. Well, the, when they, they looked at it, uh, yeah, that that growth. That growth really took off in the in the 50s and 60s, and it peaked around 1985, and then since then, um, since about 1990, the the church in America has has been declined, and it's not just the Church of Christ. I, I don't want to make it sounds like it, it's just our group, but it's it's uh, church in general. Uh, Janie and I had a uh, foreign exchange student from Italy and, that came and stayed with us in 19, uh, 20, 2019, not 19, 2019, and she was just amazed at how many churches there are, there were. And, and we're, we lived in rural Kansas, so it's like there's there's a lot of churches because her experience, and and she's a young person uh, of uh, 18, you know. What she knew is the decline in Europe is there's just not many people that still attend attend church. Um, exactly. Rise of socialism, uh, secularism, um, that that idea that that's. Yeah. Well, one thing they fight in Italy is it, it's the Catholic Church. Mm. Uh, I was over there for a while, and in a. Yeah, I was in Naples, and in a, in a town of over, they said four million, but it's really more like seven million. But of that many people, there was one Church of Christ, and it was a uh, hundred people, maybe. It was growing, but mm -hmm. uh, slowly. Yeah. But in this article, uh, in their report, again, it's pretty sobering. Uh, that they wrote that the churches of Christ lost more than 2,000 people and nine congregations a month from the from the years 2015 to 18. So that should spur us to to really open our eyes and, and see that you know we we've got work to do. We we still have work to do. Uh, the four factors that they presented in their findings that kind of uh, point to this decline is. The grain of the member membership. The the memberships are getting older. Younger younger generation groups are not are not. They're losing them. Um, this ambi uh, uh, and I can't even say it. Evangelistic laryngitis. Just that you know reluctance to to uh, to to tell others, to share with others, and then the failure to, to plant churches. So I just presented this to kind of give you a, an idea that, uh, yeah, the e evil, evil wants to overcome the church. It's not going to. It's not going to win. But uh, we, need, we, we have work that we need to do. Um, so in that, in that Great Commission, we had those action words, right? Uh, one of those words was go. So this morning, where Steve left off, he wanted me to kind of pick up with the, the idea of what that really 
what we're really trying to get at when we say go. And so um, it's a little word, right? Go, two letters, but it's a, it's a powerful word, right? Um, if we look back in Genesis 9, we see God giving a mission to Noah and his sons. And he does that in two different verses. Verse 1 and verse 7 of Genesis 9. God told his, his Noah and his descendants to be fruitful and increase in number, multiplying on the earth and increase upon it. Um, in Genesis 11, a couple of chapters later, we see that as mankind was moving, it says they were moving eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. So they started out following God's mission that he had for them, but they got to a place where they decided they were going to, to settle. God wanted them to populate the whole earth. They chose to settle. Um, so our first opportunity for group discussion this morning is are there similarities between Noah's descend, uh, descendants mission and our great commission from Matthew 28 what do you think what in Noah's commission the church didn't exist but I, I, I'm trying to get more at the language. God, God telling Noah, go. Um, is, they're both commands, exactly. They are both commands. Does the, does the language sound kind of similar? Yeah, the language sounds similar. Go. Of course, what they were told to do is different than what we're told to do. Uh, we're, we're, we're populating, we're making more members, we're making more disciples. Um, they're, they, were, they were just increasing mankind, God repopulating the earth after the flood. Okay, but I guess what I was trying to get with that question is uh, similar language, similar scope, go and populate the earth. Um, but then again, what did, what did the, those descendants of Noah decide to do? They decided to settle. And so the second question is, are we settling today? You know, we have our great commission. Are we, are we settling? And in what ways would you suggest that we're settling sense that we assume a lot of things. We assume a lot of things. Uh, well, that person has been in the church for the last 30 years. They should, they should be an adult, as in a Christian. Are they really? I mean, we have people older that are babes still in Christ, even though they're baptized. And we, we assume, like, well, you know, they've gone to church, they know, they should know. But do they really? And we don't pursue it. I mean, we just, like, I farm. Uh -huh. Sometimes I'm lapped in, oh, well, he's a farmer. He works three months out of the year and does nothing in the nine months. <laughs> <laughs> but we lap people into that, you know, yeah. who you are. You sure. Are teachers. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I guess in today's world, here we are with the technology online. I'm listening to this. I, you know, I mean, I don't know if we really get out of work like we used to communicate with people, mm -hmm. visit. Yeah. I think we're too worried about upsetting people. I mean, everybody's got different beliefs nowadays. You try to tell them how you believe you're wrong. So it's kind of sometimes people just take the path of least resistance. Right. John? I also think we, we're so busy with our minds that we have certain television programs that we don't miss. We have certain activities that we don't surely participate in. And then we have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren who are involved in activities 
and we get so busy, we, we easily forget what the reason we're here. I mean, it's all of those things are good, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not. They're not the best. Now, when they Kathy? say uh, twenty percent of the people in the church do the work, the work is not necessarily cleaning the building or whatever, but it's also involved in getting in people's lives. And that takes a lot of time and energy. Uh, in a small group, you get to be friends with somebody, and you get in their life. And sometimes we have to get that close to make a difference. We've done that for years, and it, it, it makes you tired. But you also feel like you're doing what God wants you to do. I have a weird attitude. Church is fun. I mean, it's hard some days, but in my heart, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And that's my, my best fun. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, the second part of that, I might get in trouble for this. But when I ask, are we settling today, I want, I want us to think about this building, this church building, and the activities that happen here. Are those activities building and equipping us and supporting us to go out to our neighborhoods and to our workplaces? Or, or are we settling with being comfortable coming and and my Christianity is kind of happens here at this, in this place. And I think that's what was kind of happening uh, there in Genesis when they were settling was they were getting comfortable. They were, they were staying where they, where things were good, where, where they were uh, not, not feeling some of the pressures of, of the outside world and things like that. Well, I think consumerism is, Really what I was trying to do. And when we do church to in, okay, with activities, that's kind of settled because they're supposed to go. Not they're supposed to be here because they figured it out, not because we, we you know enticed them in. We're supposed to go make the disciples, and that way they gather and. America has become a consumer church environment. What have you done for me today? Mm -hmm. Rather than what can I, you know, I like John F. Kennedy's uh, statement about government. Don't ask what your government can do for you, but ask what you can do for your government. Now, I don't like a lot of government, but I sure like the, the sentiment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Before we move on, yes, ma'am. I think also that a lot of people kind of stand back because this world is so judgmental right now. And so when you go, as you say, and try and teach, people can shut up on you and, you know, I don't want to hear it. And then it's difficult for you to reach out again. So to learn how to which I know a lot of people have to church for a while. How you, you go uh -huh. and be comfortable with what you say and do so that the person that you have interacted with is comfortable with you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I, we're going to talk about that a little bit more where, uh, you know, what that word share doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it, it could be just sharing sharing my faith, sharing, sharing a good thing that's, that's happening in my life without, you know, we not starting the, the conversation of, uh, you know, are you, are you saved? Or are you, you know, just kind of opening those doors by sharing more versus, versus those things that maybe will shut the door a little bit more. I think we've gotten so comfortable with the aspect of being free in this country, but our freedoms are, you know, some of them are being taken away at this particular point. I mean, that's just pretty obvious. Um, but I think um, what we have to remember is God's never told us that um, we were guaranteed to be free. Uh, I mean, think about people throughout the world, outside of the United States, that share the gospel at the risk of life and limb. Persecution. Mm -hmm. um, we are kind of going through a process right now, and our mindset as Christians probably needs to change and we need to stand up. Uh, you know, I think about even like, you know, in the work environment and stuff like that, 
um, in the aspect of like uh, transphobic and you know homophobic and all these types of things. Like, there's a lot of things that I can say uh, if I say, you know, if I live my beliefs fully at work and I say something to someone, I could lose my job, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, at a certain point, the Christian is going to have to be like, you know what, enough is enough. I'm just going to have to stand up. If that life and limb comes or that yeah. persecution comes, we're told that we're going to be persecuted for being Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going through that right now. And that's, you know, we're settling like into this aspect of we don't want to rock the boat. But eventually we're going to have to rock the boat. Yes. Yeah. I, know, I don't know, I left the room, but uh, there was a lady, just recently, a girl in school <laughs> up in the Seattle area that uh, wanted to break, open a prayer group at her school. And they had just let a trans group, that this is why, because I came in when you were talking trans and homophobic, and, but uh, they had just let a trans group open their club, but they said to her, you can't open a prayer group. And uh, they, the, the, the thing that they said was the reason why was because the budget is set, we can't have any more groups. <laughs> and so, so uh, and this is just on the heels of that coach in the same area that got fired for, uh, for praying on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Well, he got his job back, won at the Supreme Court level. He won that case. And uh, I, I think he did retire. He, he went, and, went and quit. But they're still doing it. They're mm -hmm. telling her, well, they can have their trans group, but you can't have your prayer group. Yeah. Uh, it's like I told you last week, the Seattle area is horrible. Right. Uh, and, and if I had raised any, any allusions to my Christianity, everybody knew I was a Christian. But if I would have preached to anybody, I could have lost my job. in certain parts of the world that's true mm -hmm. so are we settling or are we scared to do anything I think I think they go hand in hand I think those things, we, we, we can see some of that with uh, together. Um, also another, another idea there, uh, uh, well, I wanted to share some, uh, some information here about just about the lost. Um, and we talked about this in our small group last week, the, the number of people that have not. And one of the assumptions that we made is, well, I, Shouldn't everybody heard about the gospel? I mean, to this point in this in this day and age with our technology, with the 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 worldwide transportation and all the things that we do with our foreign ministries, hasn't everybody heard? But just as we talked about those places in the in in the places those countries on the on the planet where Christianity is outlawed. There, there's people that have not heard, and it, the estimates are that over a billion people in the world today have little to no knowledge of Jesus, have, have never uh, had knowledge of the gospel, and probably have no chance of, of hearing the gospel before they die. Um, and so we have to be mindful that there's, there's still uh, work to be done uh, across the world. I, and I know I also put this scripture in there. Michael shared that several weeks ago uh, during one of his sermons that he was kind of uh, preparing our minds for the, these classes on discipleship was Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I know sometimes, and maybe you do too, do you, do you reflect on when's, when's Jesus coming back? You know, what's taking so long? Um, and, and from time to time, we have those groans of those yearnings for heaven and those longings for heaven. And we think about, 
And we focus on that when we should be focusing on, well, maybe there's work that still needs to be done, right? Maybe there's, maybe, maybe there's something to be said from the scripture that, uh, that God's patient. He, wa- he doesn't want anybody not to, uh, uh, to be saved and that uh, uh, we, we need to be mindful that, that there's still a lot of going that needs to happen. Uh, in in our in our um, uh, ministry, roughly. So when you think about that, one billion. If we look at the population of the the entire world, that one billion uh, equates to roughly twelve percent of the world's population. Twelve percent of the world's population has not been reached, has not heard the word, the the gospel message. Uh, and then another thing where uh, where we think about going, a lot, a lot of times we get in our mind that means we need to pack up, we're going on a mission trip, uh, we're taking it, we're taking the gospel somewhere else, right? Uh, and so the the writers of this curriculum kind of kind of uh, suggested that maybe a literal translation of Matthew twenty eight nineteen when it says go is maybe a literal translation could be as you are going make disciples which which would mean as you go about your daily lives this is this is something that is a natural process it's not something that we um, we we cut out of our daily lives just like just like what John was saying we a lot of times we fill our daily activities with those things but we we forget that maybe maybe this go this idea of of, of taking the message and um, going as as we go about our daily lives means that um, we're doing this as just a normal part of of who we are on a daily basis wherever we're at uh, you know, outside these four walls. So, here's an individual activity. So, think about this, and this is a challenge for you this week. But think of one or more non-Christians in your life. Think about them by name. Um, could be somebody that's a, a family member, somebody in your workplace, in your school, somebody that you share. Uh, your children's activities with they play on the same sports team or whatnot somebody in your your circle think about that person and then number two pray for them intentionally pray for them Uh, and number three ask God to open a door ask God to somehow lead this person across your path this week or or in the next couple weeks Uh, and then the four is the is the hardest one, right? Number four, that's the hardest. Take advantage. How many times have you walked away from a conversation and uh, you thought, man, that would have been a, a, a wonderful opportunity for me to have shared something about my faith. But I just didn't grasp it. It didn't, you know, and, and I walked away with a... <laughs> yeah. Yes, Stephen? My, my neighbor has a son who has cancer. And uh, he's not expected to make it, but uh, I knew about it and had talked to him. And I just, like a week later, I thought, man, you missed your opportunity. All you had to do was just say, hey, can we have a prayer room? And uh, the next time I saw him, I pulled him aside and said, hey, can we pray? And I told him that I felt bad that I didn't take that opportunity to pray with him. Yeah, he's a Christian as well. He will, he goes to this big church up here on Twenty Third Street, but uh, uh, he had no problem praying with me. And and it was like, why didn't I do this the first time I knew mm-hmm. about this? So yeah, if, if you, what if he was somebody that I met once and never met again? He just happened to be my neighbor, but yeah. But at least now he knows that I as well am a Christian and am praying for him and his son. John. Well, if you can make this a matter of the heart, go in being a, a command, okay, I have to go. Uh, or if you take it as this is who I am, 
And this is the heart of the thing. And as I go, I get the opportunity to, to, to do these things. Like when our kids would say, do we have to go to church today? I said, no, we get to. Yeah, uh, we get to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in, in my experience, if I go ahead and say something to them about Jesus, uh, a new neighbor moves in. Hi, I'm John Wendler. Glad to, glad to have you in the neighborhood. I go to Spoiler Church Christ. If you need anything, just let me know. That way, from here on out, they have an opportunity uh, to rely on me at some point. But if I never say anything, then we have this big uh, to do at church and I go and invite them. It's kind of like toothpaste here. Yeah. And, uh, I'm going to invite them to a special event rather than just having invited them into my life right off the bat. So I try to practice early uh, mm -hmm. opportunity. And if they ever do end up with a loved one that's passing or if they have uh, difficulty in their lives, they have the opportunity. Um, that's a good idea. That's a good point. So that's a challenge. Um, think about that. Pray about that. If that's that, that would be a way to um, to start start the process. Um, we also want to think about the idea that this is a team effort. When we're not talking about this, I'm not saying each and you, know, you guys are on your own. Each and every one. That's the purpose of the church, right? The church is our team. Um, when we think about that uh, scripture. Um, and we think about the gates of Hades being uh, opposed to the, who, who, who was it that we thought was going to win the battle? Was it Paul? Was it the 12 disciples? No, it was the church. The church together is who's going to be victorious. This, this is not an individual fight. Um, we're all individuals that are, um, you know, doing our part. And that's, that's kind of moving us into this next idea that we're, we're parts. We're parts of a body, right? And we all he, have different talents and gifts, and we, we come together, and we, uh, we're a team in this. And so some parts of that Christian walk can be accomplished individually, right? Um, but then much of our mission happens better when we function together as a group, right? Will we all agree? So would somebody read for us uh, the scripture, Romans 12, 4 through 8? Who would like to read for us? Okay. Romans is after John. But before first John. 12, 4 through 8. But we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use in our ministering he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhorting, he who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. So what do you take from that scripture? So What's I the... kind of on that I did a discipleship class one time, and one thing that kind of stood out to me that God put on my heart after that, I worked in the car business. So I'll get 300 people a month through my door. And one thing I started doing after that, I'd give them my car, and I'd say, hey, it's got my cell phone number on there. You can reach me day or night. Unless it's Sunday morning, I'm going to be in church. But you can come join me, and I'll visit with you there. I might I like not that. have all the answers, but I just got to get them in the door. If I get them in the door, then I got John, and I got all these people around me that can help. Yeah. So that was kind of the thing my tool was. I'm in front of a lot of people. So I have an opportunity to get that out there, just the initial, to try to get them in the door. Honing in on your individual talent. What what do you bring to the table that could 
collectively, um, you know, using the other members that have talents with the teaching and the evangelism um, to then to them do maybe to help you reach that person. I like that. I like that. Thanks for sharing that. Well, I think it's also that every single part is equally important. You know, think about the track team. Uh, you go to the track and field event. You know, there are individual events that at the end of the cumulative team points. And, you know, so every single point matters. You know, there's not like, oh, you can go with the soccer on this event. You know, we need no, we need every single point. That's true. And even in the track, my son ran a few times. Or is it the 800 where there's four people that pass the, but, you know, even with that, you've got a little, some of your slower runners that you place certain places and you know what their strengths and their weaknesses are. You want that fast person to be, you know, the, the tail end of that because they're going to do the finishing work of, of getting across the line. But it's, it is, it's, it, we're, that's why we're presenting this as like a team sport type of thing because that's a good analogy for what we're trying to accomplish. It's important for us to look at ourselves, okay, what is my gift? And not look at our brother and sister and say, they should be doing this. You know, everyone has to lift themselves to support others. Yeah. And you may be the only Bible, but then it's you. That's right. My life. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Well, that's what the gospel has to be filtered through me on. You can't, you can't just be a good person. Jesus has to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And your conversation has to have Jesus in it. You have to really learn to talk to people through Jesus. You know, oh, I was reading just the other day. Or, you know, when I was reading this passage, I was thinking of you. And it would really encourage you. Or the conversation just has to be filled with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a fella at the uh, north side. He's a chiropractor, and uh, his brother's name is John. And we do, you know, the docs. Docs. He is the most amazing person because everything he does. Jesus is a part of it in this conversation. Great. And nobody, everybody comes to him because he's so good at, at doing chiropractic stuff. But I love it because I get to hear about Jesus the whole time. <laughs> yeah. It, it's incredible. Well, it's, it's good that we had that discussion about our individual gifts and talents because that's where, and the, the second bell just rang. That's where we're going to start next week with the next. And you guys got away this week, but beginning next week, we will have our first small group. Okay, so think about your individual gifts, talents, abilities. And if you're brave enough to come and to share with a few other people in your small group, that's what we're going to start with next week, okay? Okay. Uh, Thanks, you guys, and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I'll be interested to see how.